This, 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 this is the power of pro wrestling. A podcast by wrestling fans for wrestling fans. Thank you for listening and enjoy the show. Welcome to the fourth episode of this very special fifth anniversary of the Power of Pro Wrestling podcast. This is your host, Robert Red, And I'm Chris Honigan. Thank you guys so much for joining us. Yes, five years. Woo, you're going to love the last show we do. But hey, before we get there, we got to conquer here. We're going to talk about MSG. We are going to throw some grays down on a whole lot of topics. And I got a fatal three count that you might want to have your ears open for. But um, why don't we kick it off with a little MSG? What do you say? Yes, why not? Let's talk about some Madison Square Garden, which is called the Mecca of Pro Wrestling. Or, in particular, the city of New York. Okay, this sounds interesting. Well, you do realize that this year, a lot of crazy stuff have went down in New York. Yeah, most definitely. Case in point. Did you know there were that there were two major title changes that actually happened at house shows, non televised house shows? Wow. Two this year. Two, two. And for those of you who don't believe me, I got one for you. Manhattan Mayhem. This year, the Hardys showed up unexpectedly to Ring of Honor the same night Bully Ray showed up. But anyway, the Hardys showed up and beat the Young Bucks for the Ring of Honor World Tag Team titles. Wasn't televised, even though the cameras were there. It wasn't televised, and it was a house show in the Hammerstein Ballroom, New York City. Well, months later, AJ Styles defeats Kevin Owens for the U.S. title. America, uh, America. Across Woo! And get this, it happened across the street from the Hammerstein Ballroom in a little place called uh, Madison Square Garden. And keep in mind, this is the first time that non-televised house shows, especially MSG, have gotten major props and major worldwide exposure since the year 1997, the Monday before WrestleMania. Here is the question. The question is... Should major title changes occur at non-televised house shows? Uh, It's a difficult one for me because I'm kind of on the fence for this one. I don't lean lean to the right or to the left too far. There are benefits and detriments of having a title change at a house show. It makes the house show. I agree with you. It makes the house show feel more special. It gives it a sense of unpredictability. So, in cases, it is good. But in a lot of ways, you can lose business for making a title change at a house show uh, because you have to think of the bigger picture. If a title change happens at a house show, potentially only the 10,000 or less that's in attendance gets to see it. So you really aren't going to make the money off of it like you could if it was televised or on a pay-per-view slash network special. So, I mean, and it can be good to make the house shows unpredictable and help with the house show business to where people might think, oh, a title change is the last house show. Maybe we'll get one here, which that's kind of silly thinking because they're not going to do it too often in WWE. But... Uh, in a sense, it can be detrimental to house shows to change your title just for the simple fact of you're going to lose money and leave money on the table to have a title change in such a small viewing audience. So, oh, it can be either good or bad, and that's that's why I said I'm kind of on the fence with this one. So, I mean, it just depends on the circumstance and the situation, whether or not you should pull a, a title change or not. Well, NYC was sold out, and, and here's the craziest thing about this NYC show. And actually... Of those two New York City shows, house shows that I mentioned, here's the craziest thing about both of them. The both were sold out. Madison Square Garden was sold out for the one that happened with AJ Styles winning the U.S. title. Madison Square Garden was sold out. The Manhattan Center was sold out. 
And the crazy thing about this whole situation is the last time WWE had a title change that occurred at a non-televised house show before this one was when Primo and Epico won the tag, tag team titles. titles. Yeah, it's been a while. So, I mean, it was time, I guess, to see a title change because it had been so long, so it was kind of effective. But, I mean, you can't do it very often. No, no, you can't do it very often. But with WWE's house shows numbers being really, really down and Madison Square Garden being, like, the only house show that counts because only a certain few people are chosen for that show. And now here's the one catalyst of this whole deal. You didn't have Brock Lesnar advertise on that show. You did not have John Cena advertise on that show. I don't think you had Randy Orton advertise for that show. I could be wrong. But really think about this. Madison Square Garden sold out. And you had Nakamura. And you had Finn Balor. And for the Ring of Honor show, you have pretty much regular Ring of Honor talents. Then the lights go out. All of a sudden, the Hardys are in the ring. They challenged the Young Bucks for the titles on the spot and, bam, win the titles. It's in, it's it's crazy. I mean, I, I understand from a television perspective, yeah, you it's title changes at house shows should not happen very often. But the only catalyst I give to this is AJ Styles and the Hardys ended up opening everybody's eyes to – to the quote-unquote breaking news because now breaking news has been put back on the forefront. Yeah, I mean, it generates buzz and stuff, and it gives that sense of unpredictability that we kind of talked about. I mean, it shouldn't happen but, too yeah. much, but yeah. you you got well, people it's saying, oh, my goodness, well, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute, he's a new champ. Let's tune in. Yeah, uh, yeah, it gives that sense of unpredictability that I kind of talked about WWE needs uh, in my Fatal 3 count. So, I mean, it's good. It's almost like I said that Dusty Finish that I defended last time. Mm-hmm. It adds unpredictability, and it makes you want to see what happens next, just like you would in a TV show, a movie, anything. So, I mean, and in a sense, it that's why I said it does have its good points. If you don't do it too often, and... It's good to have a title change at a house show because it can generate that buzz and you can be like, what's going to happen and, next? And it can get people to tune in. But then again, you can be losing money if you change your title at a house show. Yeah, uh, and those points I do agree well, agree on. Well, uh, from that deal to something else that could be a little yeah, bit of unpredictability. And, and this podcast, yeah, because this podcast is not going to be a failure like we're going to do in this next segment. Oh, you know it ain't. And this one... It's called Report Card. That's hands from the segue there, right? Pass or fail. But in this case, it won't be a pass fail. We're going letter grades on this one. We're going to even take it uh, one step further. We're going to be one step closer to the edge. Absolutely. But we won't break. Right on. Sometimes you just need a little room to pray. But anyway, this game is called Report Card. Here's how it works. And yes, you can play alone at home. Hey, we give you a topic inside of our report card deal. And hey, you grade it from A to F. And if you are undecided, I am complete. You ready to get this one? Yes, most definitely. And get it started. What's the Rudolph. first one? The handling of Bray Wyatt. Grade it. Ooh. <laughs> oh, wow. Bray Wyatt uh, has the potential to be a top star and a top draw. He just, uh, this year, Elimination Chamber, he finally captured his first singles title as the WWE champion. My One of my proudest moments ever. Yes, I, I was very glad when that happened. But ever. Th- but he drops it how many weeks later at WrestleMania? Oh, yeah. So, I mean, his title... And he never got a rematch. Yeah, he never got a rematch. He got drafted over the Raw, and, I mean, he's been very terribly handed ever since. So, I mean, the booking overall of Bray Wyatt, I don't want to say average C, so I, maybe a C minus, a little bit below average, the booking of Bray Wyatt, because he's just he's a lot of talk without delivery. He has some good moments from time to time, but, I mean, he's, he's, he's not really delivered, and he has kind of been disappointing. So, I mean, maybe I'm going to – it may be a C minus is a little too generous, but I'm going to go C minus. I'm going D plus. It could it could have been way worse, and I could have really gotten it an uh, F, but I'm going to come a little slack here. D plus. Simply for the fact that, you no, know, 
John Cena won the championship, and he and he said in a press conference a couple of years ago, after his feud with Bray Wyatt, he said a couple of years ago that Bray Wyatt will be the champion. Even if I held the title, Bray Wyatt will be the champion. Well, the deal came true, like you said, Elimination Chamber. I have to say one of the proudest Beating moments John ever. Cena, who was the champion. Well, he eliminated John Cena, Yeah. then beat AJ Styles. Styles yeah. But D-Mon is because I feel like he's given a Raven treatment from 2006. Raven lost the title in 2005 to Raven at a house show before Impact went live. Went Raven on Spike lost TV. to Raven? Yeah. Well... <laughs> Well, you can you can say it like that, even though he truly lost to Jarrett. Yeah. But yeah, Raven did lose to Raven, but I'm going Raven did lose to Jarrett. But that was in Canada. That was a house show right before Impact went on Spike TV. Well, the same case can be made here for Bray Wyatt. Bray Wyatt's a champion, won in Elimination Chamber, lost it at WrestleMania, never got his rematch, and get this, his rematch was supposed to have been for the title. But due to the whole superstar shakeup that everybody wants to wee about, it was a failure because he never got his rematch. And bottom line, he's never even seen the title picture since. D plus. Next. The resurgence of Impact Wrestling or GFW Impact. Oh, this is a hard one. Uh, for the longest time, uh, Impact Wrestling, TNA, whatever you want to refer to it as, has been a poison brand and been a damaged brand with all the damage that's been done. Here the last couple of years before it was bought by Ed Norholm and Anthem, um, they were having trouble paying talent. Just a lot of bad stuff was happening to Impact Wrestling. So they do seem to have a resurgence with Anthem buying them and the whole GFW thing. And so you got uh, some new talent coming on. You've got Jarrett returning in place of Dixie Carter. So, I mean, they have had a good resurgence. I've not really kept up with the product, so I can't give a fair estimate. I'm not, I don't want to give it an I, I but I'm going to give them a B because I do feel they have had a resurgence and they have kind of, they're starting to do a lot of damage control. Although the El Patron situation being the champion and then allegedly doing what he did with Paige. It's, it's, allegedly. Yeah, I'm going to say allegedly. I mean, that you're innocent until proven guilty. I'll give him the benefit of the doubt. I really want, wish he would shut up like you say, uh, say Rebby Hardy would. But, I mean, I'm going to give him the benefit of the doubt, but I'm going to say B right here for the resurgence of Impact Wrestling. A++. plus plus. And that's not being biased. It's just telling it like it is. A++. Plus plus. Slammiversary was an amazing pay-per-view. Excellent pay-per-view. And there were a lot of people. And the crazy thing is ESPN really got behind this pay-per-view simply for the D'Angelo Williams factor. Yeah, and I so mean, did Fox. Yeah, and that's what I'm saying. You've got D'Angelo Williams. And they're starting to get that mainstream cross-promotion. And you've got ESPN coming. So, I mean, a lot of good things have started but coming. Cra- but the craziest thing is why it's the A++ is because Impact, belonged in a combat in a combative sport style genre and that's what anthem and fight network provided they needed a new they needed a new contender same way with ring of honor needed something for sinclair in order for people to really tune into the sinclair stations not just for their network affiliations they needed something and the crazy thing is how run it it's Jeff Jarrett back in the picture, but he's not back as the owner, and he's not back as the promoter. He's not even back as a booker. He's just back as the quote-unquote behind the scenes. Yeah, well, he is a consultant, so, I mean, he can give yeah, some the input. But A++. We're about to get touchy here. <laughs> Cody Rhodes, oh, Cody, away from the WWE. Great it. Ooh, well, 
I have to give this a good grade just for the simple fact he is holding the Ring of Honor world title. Yeah, and, I'm right. And WWE, he uh, had been relegated for his last few months there as Stardust, which wasn't a terrible gimmick. It had some problems at first, but it did kind of hinder him after the death of his father and stuff like that. He didn't seem to be enjoying it very well. So, I mean, he, got rel- he asked for his release from WWE. He had the infamous viral list of people he wanted to face outside of WWE, and he's done so much outside of WWE. Hey, he's a member I'm of a lot more. He's a member of probably the most popular faction outside of WWE, or the maybe just running. Yeah, uh, Bullet Club. He's a Ring of Honor World Champion. He's been successful. I cannot grade him uh, any failing grade. I I almost have to give him an A minus. This is this is too good not to give him an A. I'm I'm. I'm going to tie with you, a minus on this one, because he has changed the game of the Ring of Honor World Championship, number one. Because the last time that the Ring of Honor World title changed the game as far as a champion was held, was holding that belt, it was the last time it happened, it was our beloved Daniel Bryan that literally put the yes. Little, yeah, yes. Yes. Our beloved yes. yes man that literally put the, literally made a little stance concerning his Ring of Honor World Championship on Reign. Cody, he's admitted to the world, and he's admitted whether it's Rolling Stone Magazine, the Sports Illustrated, even ESPN. He's admitted to the world that, yes, he's making more money than he ever did in WWE. No question about it. But he is calling his own shots. And now his wife is now a trained professional wrestler. That means... She could be implemented, no question about it. She could be implemented in the whole deal. So, A, a minus, I'll tell you with that one. Oh, it's finna get touchy here. Next, WWE's Women's Revolution. Great. Ooh, the Women's Revolution, when it first started, really had some promise to it because this really started back in NXT. You can really. To me, I say the women's revolution started with Paige and Emma at the first NXT takeover because women's wrestling up to that point was not taken seriously. It was seen as a joke, a filler match. I I got a pee break. I got a smoke break. Because I remember back in the day watching wrestling, the pay-per-views and stuff at a local Wings establishment. I'm sure I've mentioned on the show, Wings to Go. Well, some of our buddies who are wrestlers in this local area, who we would watch it with, maybe not sitting together all the time, but watch it with, at, in the same venue, when it was a women's match, a lot of times they'd go out and smoke or they would do something else. Else, So for the longest time, women's wrestling has been seen as a joke. And then you've got, along comes Paige and Emma at the NXT TakeOver show and really start to change the game. Mm-hmm. What I'm brings with- it to the next level that I've said off the podcast to my co-host numerous times was Natalia and Charlotte after Paige vacated the belt. That's what brought the women's revolution to a, the next level. Because I remember watching that takeover er, in the our studio here, which is my room I'm recording in, and just like being on the edge of my seat, I'm like, man, this is a women's match, and it's really good. And it's Charlotte and Natalia. They were just putting on good matches. Yeah, so, I mean, this starting had promise, but... Over time, it has just been terrible. They have been booking the women terribly. So I don't want to say it's a failure. It fails. It's an F or maybe even a D these last several months or years. But overall, I think I'm going to be nice and say C. F minus. And the reason why F minus is because, granted, and I've said this numerous times, NXT different than the main roster. Night and day difference. Whether you're a male or whether you're a female, night and day difference. And to quote a a quote from Conan, revolutions are not introduced. They happen out of nowhere. This revolution did not happen out of nowhere. Something can have some promise. There's a big difference between something having promise to it and something that actually executes the promise. Gordon Soley has always said this regarding championship matches. Intensity and execution. The women's revolution, the women's division, no disrespect to them, because, you know, I, I know I, I love me some women wrestling. I've, I've been loving women's wrestling since the 80s. Women's revolution... 
the big difference is you have the intensity, and that's good to have. But execution was bad to have. You didn't organically let the quote-unquote hell in the cell main event organically grow to something that could be promising. It was just randomly introduced just to build up Charlotte's ego. And then the women, the women's money in the bank ladder match. On one hand, you literally disrespect your paying customer. On the other hand, you end up bringing it to a network television just to see if you can get a buzz out of it. And you ended up with the same result. So F minus, in, in, my, in my opinion, with the women's revolution, if they can get their heads together and have some new talent, if they're really going to introduce new talent onto the main roster, don't introduce them by Stephanie McMahon. Have a match, and then have them storm in, do the same thing like you did, do the same thing like you did with The Shield. The Shield was not introduced at all. They stormed the scene. They took over. That's how you're supposed to do a takeover. That's how you're supposed to do a revolution. Okay. That's why I guess it. Well, my question before we end, since we're in a report it. card, who could save the women's revolution or who could spark some interest in the women's revolution if they were introduced to Raw SmackDown? Who do you think could help bring maybe some interest to the women's revolution? If she was still competing right now, and this is a big if, I think... Sarah Del Rey, Sarah Del Rey, if she was an active competitor, I think she could be one of the people that actually helps it big time. Because look, I mean, because all due respect to Natalia, all due respect to Charlotte, and even all due respect to Sasha. No offense, girls, and even all due respect to Bailey. It really hasn't become interesting to the point where it's must watch, and it really hasn't been that competitive to where it's must watch. And the segments that you're on, it really has been either short and sweet, or if you're in the main event spot, it's really has been not so much of a long, but it's been somewhat competitive, but somewhat not competitive. It keeps you in, but keeps you out. But, you know, I will have to say, if if Gail Kim returns, after if she returns next year, after the after after her retirement's over, because she will be retired from Impact Wrestling starting next year. But if she returns to WWE next year, I could say she could be at the top of my list. In all honesty. Okay. Well, let's move on. What you got well, next for us? We're going to stick with this whole thing. The booking of Bailey. Oh, oh. If I had to do blank space, this would, I told you this would be heavy. Yeah, this would be uh, this. Uh, yeah, this would be heartbreaking for me if I was doing the fill in the blank for Bailey. Bailey for the longest time. I, I love Bailey. Even when she was first introduced, I kind of made a joke about Bailey, not joking, saying she was a joke, but I just would joke because of her figure, and I would refer to her chest area, and I'd call her big. Boobs Bailey, I'll say it that way. I just didn't call her Big Boobs Bailey. Not the hey, Better Business Bureau. Yeah, not the Better Business Bureau. Oh, and then Bailey, something happened. Bailey started to grow on me and stuff like that, and just her character of being like this underdog, just like another underdog that says yes. And it, it just, you wanted to see her, and just her booking in NXT was great. And then you had her finally win the NXT Women's Championship after failed attempt, after failed attempt, after failed attempt. So it was someone you could finally get behind. And when she finally beat Sasha at NXT TakeOver Brooklyn to be NXT Women's Champion, it was great. And then you had her book great. And then you along came Asuka. And just the match between her and Bailey was amazing. And then you have her show up at Battleground last year as Sasha's mystery tag team partner. Great. But since uh, coming to the main roster, uh, coming to Raw, uh, she started out okay, but here the last several months, Bailey's booking has been effing atrocious, if I can use Justin Labar's words. It's been terrible. If I'm giving her an overall booking of Bailey, I'm going to be nice and give her a C, but if I was doing the last several months of Bailey's booking, I would give her a D minus, maybe even an F, because it's been terrible. She's just been booked badly these last several months, and it's just it's heartbreaking for me. Would her winning the championship at Mania, would that 
have been better than her winning the title before Mania? Yes, it would have been, and that's where a lot of people were confused because if you're going to give a payoff of a Bailey winning a championship like that and breaking Charlotte's undefeated streak that she had at the time, you don't do it at a throwaway fast lane pay per view. That's something you save for the big stage. So that's where uh, the bookers should take responsibility for screwing up Bailey and creative because they should have not pulled the trigger until WrestleMania. Well, that deal, her winning the championship before Mania instead of at Mania, and the constant crappiness of her with the less of bless makes this sucker a D minus. Because the This Is Your Life segment was, it, it, it was so horrible to the point where I was begging the audience in the arena to chant, change the channel, change the channel. That's how bad it was. And she never, she doesn't have the mean streak. The only time she showed a mean streak was that 30 minute Iron Woman match at the NXT TakeOver, where literally, you literally had a, a curtain sellout, is what we call in the business, where everybody's at the curtain and they're just watching right there at the gorilla position. Instead of coming out on stage, watching the match. They watched it at the, at the gorilla position. And that fire and that intensity where literally she was kicking Sasha's head into submission and Sasha had no point, no other point, no other deal but to tap out in order for Bailey to win that match and since and since Sasha her payoff. She's missing the she's missing that that killer instinct. She is. All due respect. We both love we both both love Bailey. But she's missing the killer instinct, and that's why she's getting the D minus. Okay, let's move on then. It's getting heavy now. The handling of the cruiserweight. Great. Oh, this is another heartbreaking one because with the cruiserweights, when you've reintroduced them and you've made the 205 weight limit, you have the cruiserweight classic tournament. That was must watch on the WWE Absolute network. Absolute must watch. It. Moreover, now Owen and, and Daniel Bryan, it was it, their commentary was so good. You had great money match, great uh, show stealing matches. You had Cedric Alexander and Kota Ibushi. Crowd was chanting, "Please hire Cedric!" At the end of it, and Triple H coming out, time. great. I mean, just great matches that happened in the Cruiserweight Classic. And then you got the high, the, the Cruiserweights are coming to Raw, so you're like, All right, yes, I'm excited for the Cruiserweights are coming to Raw. We've just come off this great Cruiserweight Classic. And then they're finally there. They dropped the ball. And they dropped the ball. It's it's almost like the Bailey situation. It, 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 it leaves me heartbreaking because it, they could have been so good. It's, I mean, if we're talking Cruiserweight Classic, that would get an A+. Plus. Cruiserweights now, I really don't care. I'd have to give it a D minus or maybe even an F because it's terrible. It's terrible. They don't, they, I, I'm not really interested. The closest I've become interested in cruiser weights is when they had Austin Aries take on Neville. I was actually kind of interested in that because you got star and Neville star and Aries A's and they just didn't Absolutely. pull the trigger on Aries. So, I mean, that was kind of heartbreaking. So, I mean, D minus is, I, that's, and the cruiser weight classic is the only thing that saved it from getting an F. I'm going way down simply for the fact that even after the Cruiserweight Classic, a lot of the individuals that were involved in that Cruiserweight Classic are no longer with the company. You let them go back. Here's the thing. I should not be seeing a Kota Ibushi. Literally, I should not be seeing a Kota Ibushi in New Japan Pro Wrestling right now, even competing in the G1 Climax Tournament. I should be seeing Kota Ibushi inside the cruiserweight division. How about Zack Sabre Jr. probably too would and be Zach another Sabre good Jr., one. Zack Sabre Jr., absolutely. I should not be seeing I should be seeing them on my WWE TV. But the way the WWE always does is like what I said in my in, in the first Fatal Three count I did concerning WWE being the new WCW. Oh, I broke it down and I broke the cruiserweight down and guess what? This is no different. I will I will, I'm going to give it an F just because the Cruiserweight class to save their butts. Otherwise, it'll be F++. plus plus. Well, wouldn't you be F minus minus? <laughs> or if, no, if no, that's even no. a great? Well, it'll, it'll be deadlier than, than F minus. Okay. Believe me. 
next. Oh, and we're this one may hit home to you. Oh. Based off what happened, especially the last three Monday Night Raws. This is going to hit home. The handling of the tag team division. Great. Oh, the tag team uh, division has been handled poorly for a long time. Um, It did have some bright spots there, but the handling of the tag teams has just been terrible. I'm just going to get right to it. A D, maybe even an F again. And it, and I don't I hate being so negative, but I mean you've got the tag team saying it's like Vince is on a kick of breaking up face tag teams. And it's happened and how many times this year you had at the Festival of Friendship you had Kevin Owens and Jericho. But that really broke wasn't up. necessarily a tag team. Yeah, it yeah, just, weren't a tag team, but I mean a pairing. Yeah, you've had, a pairing, you yes, had so Go Dust and R Truth have broken up. DIY is broken up. Enzo Cash just broke up. You broke up American Alpha. I mean, do I need to keep continuing on? You keep breaking up the tag teams, and you're not going to have tag teams to fight for the and, tag and team rumor, titles. And rumor New Day's, and they're rumoring New Day talking about breaking up. Yeah, and I mean, if you break up New Day, what face tag team are you going to have, the Hardy Boys? So, I mean, I have to give this like a D minus. It's just, it, it's sad to see all this that's happening. And because you had so many guys that had so much potential, but you're just breaking them up for no reason. It's And it's stupid. It's dumb and stupid, and then there are some teams that you just put together that obviously, you know, you quote-unquote put them together just for entertainment reasons, but as far as delivering goes, it's just been crappy. It's going F-minus, and the reason why it's going F-minus is because there should have been no reason why you have one segment, one issue, that being the issue of Cody Corey Graves and Kurt Angle. That issue broke up two popular tag teams that were over. Well, I will say one of the two popular tag teams though was way over. And I'm talking Enzo Cass. That team How you was, doing? How you doing? Well, right now they ain't doing so fine, and right now I'm doing pretty crappy. Yeah, because Just they're because S-A-W-F-T. Soft. Well, they are N O M O R E. No more. And that's the problem with WWE. Too many great tag teams. And American Alpha, first, okay, they helped the SmackDown tag team titles. They were an excellent team. Yes, they were. I mean, even in NXT, it's kind of like the booking of Bailey. You had Jason Jordan and try, being a tag team, he loses his tag yeah. team partner. He goes on a quest to find a tag team partner. Find he comes Chad in, Gable. yeah, inserts Chad Gable. At first, I was like, oh, please, let's not do this Chad Gable thing because he had this whole stupid Ready, Willing, and Gable. And I was like, oh, please don't do that to Jason Jordan. But as they got together, like Bailey, they grew on me and they were just so great. And then you had them win the tag titles at NXT TakeOver Dallas. And then they ended up winning the SmackDown tag team titles from Randy Orton and Bray Wyatt. Okay, you noticing something here? Yeah. That team knocked off a man who ended up becoming the WWE champion and a Both man who man has held. Who beat them. Exactly. They were the two successive tag uh, people to hold it after AJ Styles and John Cena. Absolutely. Absolutely. And here's a here's a crazy thing about this whole situation. They were the ones responsible for turning the Usos heel. And what a comparative series that was. Yeah, and I mean, it was good for the so I mean, they benefited from American Alpha. And guess coming. what? They're, they're even better now as heels than they've ever been. So the tag team division, I'll say, because the Osos got saved and they went heel, I'm giving it, I'll, I'll upgrade it up to a D. Well, they're not rated R like Xavier Woods. Yeah, and, and obviously, you know, Usos weren't relevant to, you know, the wife was on Total Divas. Well, I put them on Total Divas. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, here's the last one. And we talked about it. And if you've been following this show, you'll get my drift. Here's the last one. Pay-per-view names. WWE pay-per-view names. Great. It. Well, great balls of fire, Cornbread. You're fired. I don't think I should be roasting marshmallows at this point. Yeah. 
Well, I mean, with names of great balls of fire, it really makes me scratch my head. And, I mean, you're almost like, Vince, what were you thinking? A show, a song that was made in the 50s, maybe, or the 60s you're using for your pay-per-view name and using that song as your theme? I get it, but I'm like, really? Great balls of fire? Were you just trying to get your kicks off for having Brock Lesnar or Paul Heyman or Samoa Joe say great balls of fire? Or or better, or at least, hey, at least he wasn't in the stall. You know, saying Andre the Giant, <laughs> which was bottom line hilarious. But continue. Yeah, I, I don't know. I, I might incomplete this one because I mean WWE has good pay per view names, but then you come up with Great Balls of Fire, so it leaves me scratching my head, going, "Okay, are you going to come up with another stupid pay per view name?" So I mean, I, I might have to go incomplete. I, I'd like to see what they do the rest of the year with their pay per view names. If they leave them alone. I might give them an okay grade, maybe an average grade, just because of Great Balls of Fire and stupid names like that. But I'll, until I see what they do the rest of the year, I'm going to get – I'm and I know this is a cop-out, but I want to incomplete because I want to see more before I give we'll them give a letter grade. Well, I was judging on the fence between D- minus and F because Capital Punishment, which should never have been a pay-per-view name in the first place, TLC, a gimmick match, a gimmick match that ended up turning into its own pay per view, which isn't a bad name. I mean, it, a lot of people can argue over the gimmick, but it's not a bad name. Great Balls of Fire. I mean, Great it's Balls not of Fire, a bad top, name. It's just like why? Well, Great Balls of Fire topped the list. That's that's first and foremost. Great Balls of Fire topped the list. Then, like I said, Capital Punishment. Then, okay, Money in the Bank. Why are you giving it its own pay-per-view when it's a big deal at a WrestleMania that you can make important and you can make the match important and great? And, I mean, you're already doing a ladder match at WrestleMania you have for the past few. Why not just have the money in the bank happen at WrestleMania? And you could make it cross-branded. You could say the guy can fight for either Universal title or WWE title. It'd make it interesting, and and it could be a, a brand. You could do a trade that way. And Elimination Chamber doesn't need to be his own pay-per-view. Have it as have it as a gimmick match to where the title is on the line and you can have it in the main event. Like you did the very first one when you did it at Survivor Series in New York City. Yeah, and I mean that's what we kind of discussed in a previous podcast too. I mean the the whole gimmick match thing and the, they don't need these gimmick matches doesn't need their own pay-per-view. It needs Absolutely. To, it, it's like I, I said with dusty finishes and stuff like that. It adds the element of surprise because if you know the pay-per-view name is called Elimination Chamber, you know someone's going to have an Elimination Chamber match. So there's not any unpredictability in the pay-per-view. But say we're coming up, say, to WrestleMania or something, and you could say, you and me, Cornbread, one-on-one, and in the hell, and I sell. Hell in a Cell doesn't need its own pay-per-view. Yeah, see? And that's, and that's why the grade for it is... A D minus. Only because you brought back backlash. That's the only deal. You brought back backlash, and that's why you're getting it. But uh, why don't you uh, kind of hype up a little bit? And I know I'm going to be coming in with some uh, fatal three counts, but uh, why don't you give the people a little bit of a taste of what's coming up on the next one right before I get into my. Um, Fatal three count. Yeah, I'm going to let you rest your voice for a minute. So definitely, like I said, we are having our five-year anniversary for the Power of Pro Wrestling podcast. This Sunday is five years since we recorded our Roll 1000 podcast, and we've been doing this thing off and on for five years. So you definitely want to stay tuned to this podcast. We've had some great content this week. We're going to continue to have great content, so you definitely want to stay here. ShoutEngine.com forward slash the Power of Pro Wrestling is where you can listen to all of our podcasts. As also, the past ones are on YouTube as well, and these are going to eventually go on YouTube as well if you want to do it. I like the Shout Engine because it allows you just to have the audio, and you can listen to it in the background and stuff like that. You don't have to have your YouTube app or anything open to listen to it. You can take it on your phone. You don't necessarily have to use data. You can download it on Wi-Fi, on iTunes, or Google Play, depending on what type of device you have. You can listen to it on the go. So, I mean... And you definitely want to check this podcast out. We, we've had great stuff. So, oh, uh, you ready to close us out with the Fatal 3 Count, Mr. Cornbread? Yeah, and the Fatal 3 Count, um, 
you know, we talked about this company earlier on this program during our report card segment. I'm going to focus on it. And that would be Impact Wrestling. And the reason why you su- you should support Impact Wrestling. You know, through the 15 years, and let's be real. If you really have to compare companies that have lasted long, of course, WWE in the United States have lasted the longest. If you really have to go it by there. WCW, when Ted Turner took over, was from 1988, November 88, through March 2001. ECW, the the Renegade Company, was 1992 through January 2001. Ring of Honor has lasted from February 2002 up until now. And guess what? They're the independent company. They literally just started on the independent scene. Impact Wrestling, on the other hand, was, I guess you could, I classified as the NWA's top independent company that shot to pay-per-view. That was fortunate enough to get the pay-per-view. But look at the two companies, the last two companies I talked about, Ring of Honor and Impact. Both have lasted longer than WCW. Both have lasted longer than ECW. And if you really want to break this down, both went through financial troubles. But no one talked about the people that was responsible for their financial troubles. Case in point, Impact Wrestling, when it was TNA, NWA TNA, 2002, they were hit with way more financial troubles than they were hit now. Even during the Dixie Carter era. And that was under the ram of Jeff Jarrett. But what has happened? I'll tell you what's happened. No one has talked about the fact that Impact Wrestling's deal in 2002, their money ladder was going down at the hands of Jeff Jarrett and at the hands of the Jarrett family. But look who took over. Dixie Carter and Panda Energy. That company rolled the whole ship from 2003 when it when it got renamed TNA Entertainment, LLC. 2003 up until January of this year. All under the realm of Dixie Carter. When Paul Heyman had his financial troubles, did the whole world go blasting on Paul Heyman just for the fact that he could not keep talent? No. They literally said, hey, ECW rebounds and the rest is history. Well, it did not rebound. Ended up being on Paul Heyman still. With the exception of the franchise Shane Douglas, who actually did this in ECW before he left ECW and literally shot on Paul Heyman for being a bad businessman. But no one really got on Paul Heyman's case. Really translate all of that now. When ROH went through its troubles, its financial troubles, right after the sale or right before the sale to Sinclair Broadcasting, when Ring of Honor was in trouble, financial trouble, and they were losing talents left and right. They lost Daniel Bryan. They lost Nigel McGuinness. They even lost Austin Aries. They lost all those guys. Do their financial troubles in 20, in 2009, 2010. But did anybody complain about those? Did anybody ever complain about that company being in financial trouble, especially with the majority of a lot of their awesome talents leaving? No. They all complained about Dixie Carter, who, bottom line, had the longest run of any one person ever. Lasted longer than Jim Cornette, who, bottom line, though, will get a little bit of the blame for Smoky Mound's failure and why that company got sold to the Jared Promotions. No one ever deal with Vince Russo, even though Cornette and Russo was one of the few key players during the Monday Night War. But no one really, 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 really 
put the blame on them for a lot of their failures up until recently. So why does DC Carter get a lot of the hate? And why does a lot of people not want to watch Impact Wrestling? I'll tell you why. I think maybe some online people, they literally just said, hey, we want to watch because of the ownership. If you don't have a good owner for the company, then the company's not going anywhere. Well, WWE was in financial trouble in the mid-90s, in the early to mid-90s. WWE was in way financial trouble. They could not match any dollar that Ted Turner was offering to all these competitors. But did he ever get the blame for that? No. Instead, McMahon rebounded right after one little switch. He rebounded with his talent, built his smaller base of his talent and his roster, and guess what? It's still the most talked about deal today. And it's called the Attitude Era. Dixie Carter has, you can call, she, she may have a lot of failures, but you cannot fault her for having a lot of success. She was one of the X Factors that was key to Impact Wrestling, not only getting on Fox Sports Net, not only getting on that longest run ever for Impact Wrestling, that's nine years on Spike TV in the United States, on to Destination America, and now on to, bottom line, the partner to the big dog, and that being Pop TV. Dixie Carter should be, hey, she should be held up there in regards to, hey, she got impact this far, the same way Paul Heyman got ECW to TNN. But if I were you, I'd rather be watching Impact Wrestling. Their storylines the last two years have been incredible. Whether it's the birth of the broken gimmick or the resurgence of the wolves or even the coming of his own or the birth of EC3. Please watch Impact Wrestling. Not because Jeff Jarrett is back with the company and not because Anthem owns the company. Watch Impact Wrestling every single week on Pop because it does deliver you some impact. And that is the Fatal 3 Count. And on that note, I'm on social media, Chris Heineken 1, and I'm on Facebook. That's Twitter, by the way, Chris Twitter. Heineken 1. Yes. Little shake up. Woo, Twitter. Not my boy Tweety, but Twitter, Chris Heineken 1. I'm on Facebook at, yes, I said it. At facebook.com forward slash your corporate, Christopher David Heineken. Friday nights on the MCW in Osceola, 1098 West Kaiser Street, doing color commentary and an awesome, great wrestling atmosphere. The legacy continues, and I'm at OCW out of control wrestling on Saturdays in Hot Seat. National TV taping for strictly OCW TV episodes. That's where I am. Hey, uh, Robert, where can people find you at? Uh, Facebook, Robert Lee Red Jr. You've got Twitter at Robert Red Jr. You have Instagram, I believe it's Robert Red Jr. Uh, this uh, podcast you can find on Shout Engine, which is shoutengine.com for slash power pro wrestling that I mentioned earlier. YouTube, you can check out our episodes. And I'm going to ha- have videos on there and, uh, from time to time. Please check them so out. So you definitely want to check out youtube.com for slash user for slash Robert Red. Uh, you can also uh, email the show, oh, so PPWP podcast at iCloud.com if you want to. Shoot us an email and kind of give us your thoughts and opinions of the show. Also, you can subscribe to the podcast on iTunes and Google Play, depending on your device. So definitely check those out. But that's all the time we have for this episode. You definitely want to stay tuned next time for the Power Pro Wrestling Podcast. But this has been Robert Red. I'm Chris Hein again. We'll see you next time. Bye-bye.